grateful to uh, Deacon Huberts for reading the whole of the gospel and not leaving out that last part, which has to do with Jesus commissioning St. Peter to feed his lambs. He repeated this three times. If you go into St. Peter's Basilica, which is the largest church in the world, it's a shrine dedicated to the saint. At the base of the dome, you have those words in Latin, feed my sheep, tend my flock, feed my lambs. The church constructs out of stone and other materials monuments of faith that speak to us about the truths that we have in the gospel. This is a good example of that. Peter, of course, has gone to his reward. And Jesus made reference to how he would die. Peter would be martyred. And yet, uh, the church would continue on. And Jesus said, I am with you till the end of the age. So, of necessity, there would have to be successors holding the office that Jesus gave to St. Peter. We call these successors popes. We are now on our 266th successor to St. Peter, whose papal name is Francis. We know this. We're living in a very historical time, I'm sure. Pope Francis had humble beginnings. He was born and raised in Argentina. His father worked on the railroad. Pope Francis was one of five children. And I'm sure he was the last man in the world ever to think that someday he would become Pope. There were no indications. Even during the conclave days, people weren't talking about it. Now, interestingly enough, I remember speaking with a priest friend a couple of weeks before the election, and I mentioned to him, you know, we've never had a pope named Francis. Lo and behold, we get one. So, I'm not sure where that came from, but the Lord is full of surprises. The history of the papacy is, is uh, to say the least, a tumultuous one. The first three dozen popes were martyred for the faith. And uh, this means that anyone who became Pope basically was signing his own death warrant to a, to a certain extent. One reason for this is that the church was illegal for the first 300 years of its, its existence. The Roman government didn't recognize it. So all Catholic uh, worship and activity had to take place underground. Underground means behind closed doors, quietly. <coughs> wondering how we would function today if our, the church was, was underground. And many people, of course, would lapse from the faith, more than has been, been the case, because whenever there is oppression against the church, people, some people are lost. They, they can't deal with it. But you have a smaller church, perhaps a more faithful church. But there's always been a pope, and this is part of what the Lord provides, because we need a visible leader. And one of the things about Jesus is Jesus is risen, he's alive, but he's invisible. So the Pope, in a sense, takes up the slack in this whole mystery of Jesus, our shepherd, because he's visible. We know who he is. We know what he's about and what he represents, what his ministry is. Uh, the... Um, the world has not been kind to the popes, as, as I've indicated already, even in modern times. And Napoleon kidnapped two of them, Pope Pius VI and Pius VII. He thought uh, he had finally conquered the, the church. didn't work out. The, the one pope resigned his papacy after he was kidnapped and uh, lived the life of a monk afterward, and thus perplexing Napoleon exactly know what to do about it because he, didn't, he no longer had the Pope in, in captivity so another one was elected. Many of us can remember the assassination attempt on Pope John Paul in 1981, May 13th. He was shot at close range three times. He really should have died. The path of the 
bullet that went into his body was uh, very peculiar. It went around vital organs. That's certainly not anything that can be explained by natural uh, explanations. And he survived to be um, the holder of the office of St. Peter for many more years, Pope John Paul dying finally in 2005 and doing much work, much good work, for the Church, for God. Pope John Paul attributed his uh, being spared from death to Our Lady of Fatima, uh, whose anniversary of her first appearance there was May 13th. Interestingly enough, Pope Francis is dedicating his papacy to Our Lady of Fatima, he has mentioned that, and he will say that again, uh, on or near May 13th. Think about that. Uh, he's very close to Our Lady. We should be very happy. And we should take a cue from that ourselves, because she is our mother in the order of grace. Uh, the uh, ministry of the Holy Father is very important and necessary today as it has always been, maybe even more so. Um, the need for church unity. Represented in the net, in the St. John's Gospel, the net that did, does not tear. Unfortunately, the church has fractionated, and largely because certain periods of history, too many people didn't support the Pope. And not supporting him is really a recipe for splitting the church. And so we had the split with the Greeks in the 11th century and then the Protestant Reformation in the 16th, which, from which the world has really never recovered, the, the splitting of the church. Jesus said, I want, uh, to paraphrase him from John 17, I want my church to be one, or that they may be one. The Pope also is, uh, he's not like a president or a prime minister. He's a father. He, in fact, il papa is really what he is called in Italian, means the father. But he's the one who, not, not, he's not the one who has all the ideas so much, but he's more the one who is the authority to, to determine what is Catholic and what isn't. And, um, he has the special charism of infallibility, which doesn't mean he won't, doesn't make mistakes or that he doesn't commit sins. That, that, that's not what it means. The church has never taught that. It simply means that when he teaches as a universal pastor of faith or teacher of faith and morals, he will not teach in error, which is important for us. We should be grateful for it, for this. There are many false teachers in the world today, people who have opinions, sometimes they write them in the papers, or talk show hosts, Hollywood, I mean, the list goes on and on. People who have ideas about morality and faith that are simply not in any way, shape, or form consistent with the gospel of Christ. We must go to the Catholic Church the Holy Father is now, finally, since I suppose uh, some time ago, earlier in the 20th century, a major figure on the world stage. When Pope Pius IX died, who was the longest reigning Pope, reigned for 32 years, he was the one who gave us the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. The New York Times had about a one-inch column about him. Now, the whole world watches the church, watches the Pope, which is actually good. And uh, many people's lives are affected by this. Now, the Pope's most important practical aspect of his ministry isn't so much the speeches that he gives, although those are important, but his appointments, the bishops. The bishops of the Catholic Church are held together, really, by the ministry of the Pope. The church is a conglomeration of smaller churches, which are the dioceses throughout the world. And every five years, the Catholic bishops travel in groups to Rome to pray at the tombs of Peter and Paul, to 
visit with the Holy Father who gives some sort of a message to the bishops. Jesus did not establish his church on the basis of national groupings because if that were the case then we would be more American than we would be Catholic. I hate to say it though that there are people who identify more with their nationality than with their Catholicism, which is very sad. When we die and we come before God, all distinctions such as nationality will no longer apply. Catholicity of our faith, that would still apply. So this is something we should think about. To be a practicing member of the Catholic Church, to take the faith seriously, is something that will abide with us, or should abide with us throughout this life, and it has eternal ramifications. We are told in the story today that the apostles caught 153 fish. In the ancient world it was thought that there were only 153 different kinds of fish that existed. This means that the church must be for everyone. So the point of the matter is we all have a mission to participate in to help bring the faith to others. We're not all popes, of course. The pope has his own particular ministry, but we can work with him, and we should, to make the church what the Lord wants it to be. Not a closed-in group, but one that's open, brings in as many people as possible, because everybody needs Jesus. Everybody needs hope. Everyone needs salvation.